Hi, Yara, how are you? I'm fine. It's good to see you. Same here, same here, Farah. Yes. We'll just give it some minutes until everyone joins in from the students. Okay, sure. I would like to introduce you. We have with us today, Dr. Muna. She's SCD's dean. Mm -hmm. Hello, Muna. Hello, Dr. Muna. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for, Thank you for inviting me. your time. Thank you for inviting me. Always a pleasure. We're looking forward uh, to your talk today. We have uh, a, uh, a group of students will be joining us uh, as well as uh, um, members from the Board of Trustees uh, who are interested also to attend your uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, we have on our Board of Trustees academicians from different academic institutions, as well as um, practitioners uh, from mm -hmm. the community. So hopefully they will uh, join That's us great. Well. That's great. I wish I could come and visit uh, Muscat. It's always been a dream on my list. <laughs> you will love it. You'll really love it. It's a really nice. Uh, I know. Everybody keeps telling me it's one of the, their favorite places they've been. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Morning, Dr. Shri. Good morning. You're welcome, Mr. Azza. Dr. Yeah. Shri. Welcome in Oman. Oh, in Oman online. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Shri, it's the head of the graphic design department. Hello, Dr. Shri. <laughs> Hello. Hello, welcome. Pleasure to meet you online. Dr. <laughs> nice to meet you too. I hope, inshallah, you feel our students today, inshallah. Yeah, and it gives them. Uh, I just want to let you know that most of our students are Omani mm -hmm. and as well as female. So mm -hmm. the same here. Have... Most of our students are Lebanese and, <laughs> <laughs> and female. <laughs> as Mr. Zakaria is from our hearing impaired students, she joined us. Okay. Hello, and Ziad, uh, Ziad as well is joined. And that is coming as a as a as a company's HI student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Master Great. Zemin Allah will join us. So they will need to read my lips or they have their own uh, translator? No, the translator will join us as well. Yeah. Okay. We've introduced a, a graphic design program for the hearing impaired uh, two years ago. That's so nice. the group are, are done now with the foundation uh, program and they're moving on. They're, specialization wow wow that's great this is, this is what inclusivity is all about this is real inclusivity not just uh, words yeah <laughs> great great and uh how many uh, i mean who are you is this part of a bigger program of inviting uh talks and speakers or how is it going there uh, we usually have an ongoing series of uh inviting uh, speakers having some workshops in-house but since we moved online, we're making like bi-weekly or weekly one or two speakers for our students. Wow. And who's who's come already for the graphic design program? I would like to know, Eke, okay, just out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> just, I was just talking to Khajak Apelian because yes. we, we work together. He's a very, very close friend of mine, and we do a lot of projects together. And he told me that, oh, Farah, she had also uh, talked to me, but I think she's in June. Sure. So I no, I was actually super excited. And I told her, yes, go, I'll go ahead with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Farah has out preaching to everyone. She's quite good at doing it. <laughs> yeah. We, I yes. agree with him to have our talk around June or May. We're mm -hmm. planning it with him in June or May. Yeah, then you'll find some, uh, uh, probably some common projects. <laughs> Hello. That's great. Could you share with us, Farah, uh, who was our last speaker? Oh, yeah. Last week we had Matthew Magalini. He was uh, the creative and visual director in Meshbet Fotoya Enterprises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and he gave us a special talk about retail design. He used to work at Armani, he used to work with Bloomingdale's, Marvin Nicholas. And then he gave a special talk to students how to build your own uh, retail design. It was a talk for the interior design, yeah. Mm, okay, okay. 
interesting. Super. Yes. And in the coming weeks, we're on organizing a talk with uh, a famous Egyptian photographer who's called Karim Khayalan. I don't know if you know him. Not really. Oh, then you can join our talk. Yeah, maybe you can send me an invite. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do so. Um, and he's going to be also talking about uh, different street photography. Up to now, this is the plan. So what's his name again? Karim Al Haywan. I can share with you his Instagram account. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah you can send great. it to me. So how's, your, how's the program uh, uh, of graphic design? I mean, it's a three-year program or four-year program? Um, it's graphic four design program is four oh. years after, after foundation, four years after foundation. Wow, four years now, after foundation? Four That's years. five, yeah. yeah. And a foundation is one year? It's one year. The, the foundation program is a, uh, it's a requirement, a local requirement. Uh, where they uh, it's based on uh, consists I'm sorry consists of math English and computer so it's a general what they what we call a general foundation program okay okay the uh, national requirements and then they move on to the design foundation program okay that's what I thought okay because yeah. I, uh, we do a foundation that's purely design I mean um, yeah, yeah we do too um, we were affiliated. I don't know if Farah shared with you. We were affiliated with the Lebanese American University. Oh, really? and now we're working. Uh, now we're working on a collaboration. Uh, since we got accredited, we no longer have to uh, be affiliated. So we're working on a collaboration together. Oh, nice, nice. Who's your contact there? I've I've worked there. I've I've taught there many courses as a part time. Uh, we've been working with them uh, since 2004. So we have a, a lot. Oh, uh, we have uh, Randa Abdel Bayi. We had Tariq Khoury before that. Uh, Did you mean? Yeah, Yasmin Ta'an, yeah, all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very close friends, especially it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I made you a co host, so if, in case if you want to share a screen. Shall I start or we're waiting uh, yes. uh, for students? Dr. Oh, Shri, we give them five more minutes. I think my class now is ready. Most of them are joined. Uh, Miss Bashair class also must be here, but I don't know. She uh, she is she feel not good today. Oh. She has an excuse. Okay. But we can start. But but uh, in case uh, we have to to talk in Arabic because uh, Hoda Miss Hoda can't English. Oh. To speak on the Arabic and to translate Ooh. into Arabic. No, I um yeah. I mean, I need to speak in English because most of the words are in English, but I'm just saying that if I slip into Arabic a little bit, <laughs> does it really uh, No, uh, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll drive, uh, I'll deliver here your, uh, uh, your description in Arabic uh, via uh, WhatsApp, maybe. Okay. I'll be in touch between you and Ms. Hoda to okay. give the students their uh, translation in Arabic. So uh, we can wait, and um, I'm here. Yeah, just yeah. Coming to yeah. Start. yeah, we can give them two so minutes. Coming, so sure. And don't worry if anything. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Or if anything slips in the miscommunication, we will assist you in that. Yeah, don't worry. In the language. So how many students do you have at, uh, at AUB in the graduate um, department? Uh, now we have uh, entering 16 students. Um, and uh, in uh, second year, we have 23. In third year, we have 28. And in uh, fourth year, we have 25. So it's okay. around 20 average, 20, 22. And um, first year passes with the foundation, and then we get more students from architecture uh, coming oh. in because they found it too difficult. <laughs> and some of uh, uh, our students slip into, so it's very like um, um, uh, osmosis. <laughs> okay. We have the same strategy over here. Yeah. Some of yeah. the architecture and interior design students shift to graphic design. So it's a yeah. global strategy, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> how many students do you have? 
Um, I'm not sure, Dr. Shri, how many students do you have in the graphic design department? Uh, uh, two tele students from, from one to four, uh, uh, 185, I think. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's a good number. Yeah. Yes. Misoda is here. Should I join the translation? Yeah. Hello, Masuda. <laughs> Hello, Miss. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> so you have you have a new job to translate from English to uh, to, to, to to sign language. <laughs> <laughs> that would be some Good experience. New experience, <laughs> Masuda. Uh, new experience. And sure. Uh, Miss Yara Khuri is with us from the American University of Beirut. She's an award-winning uh, graphic designer and typographer. Um, and she has been in the field for around 20 years or more. Uh, and most, most importantly, she has just published two books, if I'm not mistaken, or one, two, one. Okay, then we're, we're looking for the second one to come on the way. Coming on the um, way. Thank you. <laughs> That's great to hear. And uh, her today her talk is going to be mainly to our graphic design students from Scientific College of Design. Ms. Yara, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, I'll fill in the gaps. Um, first, I would like to really thank you for this invitation uh, to share a selection of the publication projects I designed uh, during my years at Al Muhtaraf. So I've worked um, for 20 years at Al Muhtaraf. I started in 1997, actually, and left in 2017 to join AUB as a, a full-time uh, professor there uh, at Al Muhtaraf. Uh, Al Muhtaraf is a design house uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's located there. Uh, its head offices are in Jeddah, and Al Muhtaraf is uh, is the design house that is quite uh, interested in Arabic uh, type and typography and calligraphy. And uh, this is where I made most of my experience. And uh, in the meantime, while I was working at Mahtaraf, I was also teaching. And that's where I found gaps in teaching, graphic design uh, that uses the Arabic script, and uh, working uh, for a uh, um, market that wants Arabic, but is not very keen, uh, wants also Latin much more, uh, uh, actually. So there was Latinizing projects. I'll talk about them a little bit here. So I took only the publication uh, that I made and some of the lettering and uh, um, work I do on the side. So um, a book design is difficult, basically. And it is very time consuming. And it doesn't pay well, unfortunately, because people think that uh, designing books is quite easy. But before we go there, um, I will go through the projects chronologically. And uh, I thought I might need to introduce Muhtaraf a bit, the design ethos at Muhtaraf and the way of working. It's a design studio, I, as I said, with three branches and one in Beirut where I was the design director for the three branches in Saudi Arabia and here. And uh, it's been producing some of the most controversial and pioneering work and experimental work in Arabic type design and lettering for the past 35 years, actually. So, um, and this came from the need uh, that 30 years ago, we couldn't find any good Arabic typefaces to do our design work in. So, Mafi Khutut Abadan Arabi, limited, Alil, uh, uh, very hard to find on systems. We had to buy very expensive dongles for a Quark Express that nobody has heard of now. I mean, uh, older uh, generations would have heard of Quark Express for sure, and the dongles that we paid thousands of dollars to make them read Arabic. So um, Muhtaraf took it on its own back and responsibility to design its own typefaces for its own graphic work. The hand on the right is for Omar Subair our internal uh, uh, in-house calligrapher and type designer at Muhtaraf. And on the left is Camille Hawa, who's the director of uh, uh, Muhtaraf. And I, I like these two images because they contrast and find, uh, you can see directly the influence of each other. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that are really special at Muhtaraf is that we actually hire 
full-time calligraphers. We hire full-time writers, copywriters, photographers. They are part of the team. They're not people that we get in and commission them to do something for us. They are an integral part of the team. And um, you can see, if you can see on the right, I don't know if it's your right. <laughs> so uh, Al-Muhtaraf written in a classic Thuluth. Uh, 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 and on the left with Camille's, uh, uh, it's free handwriting, basically. The, uh, so this is where the design comes in and this is where the osmosis happens between these two uh, hands. One is tied to calligraphy and ground and rules and the one and another is pushing and pulling the other way to uh, do a very experimental approach to the type. And we found out that actually, um, that actually it is very, very, the, the Arabic calligraphy is very lenient, is very flexible, if, that's, if these are the words. Fluid and uh, so, um, so I put it on the right where you are thinking about rules, left is experimentation and just like the brain hemispheres somehow um, come to think about it. So right and left. So the motto at Muhtaraf was head, heart and hand. We'll come back to it at the end. So let me jump to the books I designed there, okay? So um, I would like to start with this quote. Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be digested, chewed and digested. In retrospect, I think this is my approach to book design too. And this is something I read when I was like 14 years old and it stuck with me for a very, very, very long time. Some books are actually to be tasted like coffee table books. Others to be swallowed like long reading books and others to be chewed and digested and cherished, such as reference books that you would never want to lend out to a friend even. You want to keep them for yourself. I think it is very important to keep that in mind when you start the design of any book and you know, need to know its nature, you understand and read its content. And I cannot stress enough about reading the content of a book or a brochure or anything you're about to publish or design. I mean, I know this, um, uh, this generation and uh, their uh, bad sama'a, um, uh, sama'a, uh, uh, their uh, reputation. Reputation, excuse me. You see, that's where I <laughs> fall. <laughs> reputation for not reading, but I really think they are reading much more than we actually see, but not in the classic sense that we as an older generation think uh, reading is all about. So they're always uh, they're sliding over their phones, but they're actually reading a lot, watching, looking at images, but they're actually reading. So I would really suggest for anyone who's about to design anything that they read the content, understand it fully. Sometimes I'm sure you can't read a very big book, but you really need to understand the content. Um, and as designers, we actually think we underestimate the power of the word. And we tend to think that graphics, images, and type acrobatics uh, uh, will overwhelm the word. We forget that the public reads those letters. We put in front of them. The public, the general public actually reads. The moment you put letters in front of them, they read them. That is the, their... Uh, uh, quick instinct to do, this is their quick reaction, okay? But they also actually react physically and emotionally to the way you address those letters and you put the hierarchy of those letters, that's the typography in the titles and the text in everything. This is why content comprehension is very important. So the first step is to unpack the content and then as a designer, you repack the content. I'll start with my first uh, book, actually, with my first experience of designing serious books. The Um Kulthum Compendium took more than a year and a half to design, basically. It's a large format series of three books on Um Kulthum's uh, life and songs. They are written by uh, Sahab brothers, Elias and Victor Sahab. They're both musicians, 
uh, academicians, uh, uh, music critics and writers. And they have actually a third brother who is Salim Sahab. He's the head of the, uh, um, he's, the he he's the head conductor of the Egyptian uh, orchestra opera or something like national opera. So uh, uh, they're quite into music and they are the writers of these books. And uh, they each sat next to me and told me, uh, to took me through Um Kulthum's life, expanding the full story and their full research and what they have done and how many years it took them to write it uh, and how much time it took them to collect all the information and the song archive, many of which were lost and they had the, the lost ones actually, and they were so proud of that. So I remember like for three full days, uh, Yes Sahab took me through the life of Um Kulthum. And, um, but writers on the other hand have not given any thought about uh, images. And this book is a large format uh, book that celebrates her life and her work and her songs. So they were concentrating on just the writing and the research. So I had to search in photo archives with zero budget around the country for, uh, and I couldn't purchase any photos because there was no budget. So the search included newspaper archives that were more than happy actually found, I found out happily that they give it out for free for me. The uh, three volume compendium was designed sequentially with a diva's photo in different close-ups. This is how we know Um Kultum with her face grimaces and this, this uh, build up from, uh, from uh, from a close-up on the right uh, with her handling the her handkerchief. This is Asira. And then Aghani uh, Jiz al awwal with her farther away and Aghani Jiz al thani with her even farther. Each chapter was started with a drop word, not a drop cap as opposed to a drop cap because in Arabic, there are no drop caps. There are no word, letters, a capital letter that you can drop into the text. So I dropped the whole word using uh, nostalgic uh, uh, because um, classic nostalgic somehow uh, invokes a sense of song and dream. So um, um, the bloody text was set in very classical masque. Uh, in a medium width column. And I, maybe I'll show you just like this, something like this, very classic. And if, uh, if uh, Dr. Sharif would know that um, uh, I did it on Nashir al-Sahafi actually. Yes, so yes. so uh, it, it's very hard to work on Nashir al-Sahafi because sure. I needed that classic uh, uh, typeface at the time. And it wasn't, when we had Quark Express, we had only, uh, uh, AXT Manal and Muna and all of these typefaces. So I needed that typeface at the moment. The page numbers were set on here. Can you see my cursor in the mid? Uh, that was something that nobody else had seen. And it's a quite a, a rigid uh, uh, grid. Uh, it uses, uh, it is inspired from manuscript design also with very large margins and very um, large margins on the right and the bottom, which actually made the big, the book much bigger and heavier. I came to realize because it was my first experience, as I said. Um, the, the, the whole margins here, the, all the captions were put on the bottom of the images. The images were only in big size, large size, large format. Um, the book takes you through the humble beginnings in her village, to whom she escorted while she grew up. حتى فن التجويد مع الوالد to her death, the day she died and what happened in Egypt. Each chapter ended with specially designed motifs and these motifs on the right here. And they're reminiscent also of manuscript design where you end with a floral uh, or a calligraphic stroke that ends a, 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 a chapter. And, uh, but these, uh, these uh, motifs were inspired from Um Kulthum's dentelle and elaborate dresses. So we designed things like this for the whole book. Specially designed patterns and arabesques. Uh, they're inspired from the diva's dentelle dresses because she was very famous for her dresses. And these were designed in collaboration with Talinius Gatian, uh, a colleague of mine. They were quite a trip to be honest. 
the more we did, the more interesting the process became and what just couldn't stop anymore. We said we had uh, six chapters, we're gonna do six chap chapter ends. And then we decided, no, 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 we're not stopping. We're doing a lot more and for all the books. The second two volumes include all of Uncle Soon's records, recorded songs ever, the famous and the very rare ones. These are the songs. Each song was archived and annotated in a very detailed manner. It even analyzes the, the diva's voice in each stage of her career in the Mulahazar. This was definitely a book to be chewed and digested, not only by the reader, but by the designer too. Let's go to the next book, which I thought might be interesting for you to see. This book is uh, Saudi Artists Today. Sorry, let me, let me read it. Yeah. And um, this is the second book I would like to talk about. Um, um, it's a sequel and it has a sequel uh, that I did a few years later, four years later after this book. Saudi Artists Today is a trilingual book, okay? And it's a contemporary, uh, it's about the contemporary Arab uh, uh, Saudi artist scene in particular. The interesting problem with this project is that it's trilingual. It's in three languages, English, Arabic, and French, as it was to be launched in Paris. That's why the French is coming. Upon reading the text and understanding the structure of the book, I came to realize that there are sections that can be moved and some that cannot at all. And this is what made the book possible in three languages. So um, each artist section had a limited amount of text and which allowed for the three languages to sit comfortable on one spread or one page. Instead of giving each language a column or instead of giving each language its own space, starting from the left to right and Arabic only from right to left, uh, it, was, it was successful in merging them. I decided to do them not in columns, neither separate, but to put them all together. But actually, instead of columns, I decided on rows and uh, uh, hanging lines. So the first English hanging line was, uh, was in English. The second hanging line was for the French. And the third hanging line or uh, row line was for the Arabic. And that's how you read the whole book. If you wanted the Arabic, you would go to the third a hanging line for everything. It didn't matter what the column size, okay, or the type size, as long as readers find their respective languages on each row. It is this was a very flexible system. It turned out, and it it allowed a lot of variation in text blocks and compositions. So even images, even the CV uh, of uh, the artist himself or herself were also put in that manner. Sometimes it came in this format. So when we introduced an artist, actually you wouldn't, you had to follow the hanging line. So it wasn't as ordered as the first example I showed you. Yeah. And this one, same. So it, 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 it sort of made the rest of the book float seamlessly. Also um, the, uh, the English and French introductions came from the left side. The Arabic introductions come, came from the right side. And in the middle, it didn't matter what which order you saw those artists in because there was no particular order so for the english reader they would start with the last uh, uh artist if the, they, you were coming from the arabic side and this uh, vice versa this is the sequel that came out because the first book was quite uh um uh, uh sold out and uh it was one of the first books that came out on saudi artists uh, this is the 2014. Also, again, it uses the same uh, uh, sort of uh, grid for the three languages, and it introduces another set of designers, uh, sorry, artists, excuse me. Um, done with Saudi artists, we move to Souk Aqaz. Souk Aqaz uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a souk uh, or an open air market it dates back from pre-Islamic times. So it's a very old uh, concept of what a souk is. 
although the souk, the souk or the market was commercially uh, uh, commercial primarily, it held most uh, some of the most famous poetry compositions, competitions, or festivals of the time. Uh, it is said to have helped formalize rules uh, of Arabic language, verse, grammar, and syntax. So it was very important for Arabic languages development, basically. Um, now, uh, nowadays, it's a, a unique tourist uh, destination in Saudi Arabia, and it holds the yearly festival called Souq Aqaz. al muhtaraf was commissioned to design the identity and a custom typeface of the festival and all the applications that go with it. This is the typeface, the custom typeface, and um, uh, this is the logo here. And this was the custom uh, typeface that was designed by Kamil Hawa at Muhtaraf. I will talk to you about the book I designed and also about the writers. I, I, so I, I actually mentioned before that uh, Al Muhtaraf contains and has within its team writers and, and researchers. And one of them is actually uh, Victor Sahab, the writer of, uh, of Um Kultum book, and Elias Sahab. And uh, Victor actually did the research on the history of the Souq Aqaz because they had revived it at the time that we started designing it. And uh, that's the, the name, the phoenix of the Arabian desert or Anqa al Jazeera al-Arabiya. But I'll talk about how the design uh, was, although simple and might not be as inspirational for you, but sometimes you don't need acrobatics. You just need a simple idea to go with and, and the book is done. Um, I took the typeface that was designed especially for the Tahida and I took out the counter spaces in it and I used it on top of image dividers. I used them on dividers to, uh, with images, full blown images of the actual inscriptions that are found in the uh, location of the original Souq Aqaz. It's the square format and all the body text and everything, all the images and all the text hang from the top in reference to the massive poetry verses that used to hang from the walls in the souk, as was the tradition. And these were known as al-mu'allaqat. And they still do it, actually. So there's a, uh, there's a very famous poetry festival there that happens every year. And uh, uh, jawais are given, awards are given for the winning uh, poets. So all the book was hanging from the top with a very large margin, reminiscent of al-mu'allaqat. And that's how the whole book flowed. Some of the books actually uh, I designed were self-published books at Al Muhtaraf. We loved doing that. Uh, I don't know where we got the money to do that, but <laughs> we managed to do ideas. Uh, and we said, we're going to go ahead. It doesn't matter how much uh, it costs. So Camille Hawa, the, 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 the director of Al Muhtaraf, um, wrote a lot. And the, this is a book of, uh, or a collection of short articles called Khawatir. And uh, such as why all laundry detergent advertising always promises a whiter shirt. How white can a white shirt be each time? So, or to a conversation with a bird sitting on a windowsill. So he had a conversation, he wrote down the article. So uh, basically it's Khawater, it's in black and white only. Uh, it's his portrait, an auto portrait on the, on the cover uh, with thick board. Uh, and uh, um, um, a lining with the um, mesh, uh, linen lining, black lining uh, as a spine. So this book is to be swallowed and slowly at will. And you can read it from any page you like. It doesn't matter. Each short article opens and closes with one of Camille's sketches that are closely relevant to the topic. Sir al Medina wa Sahraha, for example, or something about al Afkar qabla al Asar. This is a book I really enjoyed doing also. And this is one of the most recent uh, books. I started it with an, when I was at Muhtaraf and refused to give it in to any of the designers there when I left. And I thought, I'll do it. I have to continue this because I really went into the life of Nahar Nassar. Nahar Nassar is, uh, is, the, is a Saudi pilot, and he's the first Saudi pilot. And he was the pilot to the kings. So this is a biography about his life and uh, how he grew to become that. The title is Urid an Atir, I want to fly. Again, Nastalik comes in. Maybe I'm really fond of Nastalik. Maybe that's my next typeface. 
very hard to do as a typeface. The cover uses custom designed nostalgic, which I drew. I didn't uh, uh, ask any uh, uh, calligrapher to do it and outlined it uh, in cloud formations. They're um, inspired from what you see on the left in manuscripts from uh, uh, Iranian Nastalik ma um, uh, manuscripts. And sort of the clouds are reminiscent of the skies that Nahar Nassar flew and the calligraphic manuscripts. The end sheets of a book, the end sheets are inside the cover. That's what we call end sheets. And they are newspaper clippings about the famous artists. And this is how the book works, sort of. Um, I have to say again that I read every word in the book in order to make sense of the images, the type, and the grid. And let me note something for you. As designers, if you have badly written text, no amount of design can save it. You can hide it for a short time. Like uh, any reader who reads bad text, no design will keep them there. You know what I mean? It will keep them for a short time, but that's it. Your, your, your game is out. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not so saying that this was bad, badly written, but I just remembered that because I've had to deal with very badly written text a lot of the times, and I know that it won't work. So, um, so I have to say that I read every word in this book in order to make sense of the images, the type, and to make the grid. And how do you make a grid for such a book? You really need to understand the, uh, the structure of the writing. So, for example, as designers, when I read a text, I directly know, are there titles, chapter openers, titles, subtitles? Are there subtitles for the subtitles? Are there um, footnotes, captions for the images? Should I make highlights? What, how many hierarchies am I dealing with here? So I need to know how many elements I am actually working with on a page somehow. So uh, in something like this, you really need to understand the, not only the text, but the nature and the way the writer wrote that text to tell the story. The, took, the, the book basically takes you from the humble beginnings of Nahar Nassar, where he grew as a little boy who saw jumbo jets flying over him in Damma, um, and who joined Aramco as a dream and that he dreamt of flying when he saw those jumbo, uh, jumbo jets coming over, uh, over him. There always should be, I have to tell you that once you read the text and you collect the images, there has to be a weaving. Yani, <laughs> a weaving of images, text, color distribution, and image size, which all set the tempo of a book. So once you start, once you start opening the book, color is one of the first easiest things to catch your eye. Then you open to a page a spread where you have a lot of text. And then you open to another with less text and more images. Then you open to another with a much bigger image. And it goes on. That tempo you have to build. And it's, it's exactly, I always tell my students, that it's exactly like a movie. If, you, if a movie starts with a lot of talk, 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 you probably go switch on Netflix and you go, ah, oh, that seems to be boring. But the moment the action starts with a movie, you're hooked. And sometimes it has to go down and then up. And it's a plot basically. And sometimes if the text is not a plot in itself, you have to do the plot visually. And the more interesting the plot is visually, the more, uh, the more your reader is going to stay, stay inside that book reading it. So these are some of the, this is how the Nastali came in to uh, the pages on the inside. The type choice landed on two a distinct typefaces, Azer, designed by Pascal Zerbe and Wael Moros, and Makina uh, from 29 Letters by Pascal too on the top. So I needed this contrast between something I love as a, uh, as a text face and something that is uh, like a newspaper clipping, an old uh, uh, a mechanical sort of typeface. Makina stands in strong contrast here with uh, the uh, Azer.
some of the images here. And you have to also make a grid that is quite flexible, where you have bigger images and much smaller images. And you add actually a note on the side, you really need to know which images are in high resolution and which are in low resolution. And never try to make a low resolution as big as you can. So avoid doing that because whatever uh, software you use, you can't create halftone dots or pixels for an image that does not exist, for pixels that don't exist. Um, so the book is also weaved with side stories such as Al Captain Aziza here. So she's the first uh, uh, captain, uh, women captain. So uh, these stories were actually woven without any images. So the designer, which is myself, had to go online and search for archives to give a face to Dr. Aziza or Captain Aziza here. You can see here, Captain Aziza proudly standing uh, since it was Women's Day yesterday or the day before, I thought Captain Aziza would be really nice to talk about here. So she's a side story in that book. And these are, these side stories when, uh, I didn't want to just put them in a, um, a paragraph that is small and just in a box. I really wanted to give them, uh, you call them comic relief in a movie. When you do comic reliefs in a movie, it's very serious and suddenly you laugh. And that's what these are. You don't laugh, but you just, they give you a, a break from the plot but it somehow feeds into the plot. So the side stories are fully colored in brick color, such as here, Anak al Nakil al Watani, come in. But the moment I saw those uh, uh, awards uh, uh, that Nahar Nassar took and all the accolades, I knew I had to do something with them. So this page on the left here opens up to these accolades and they were beautifully, some are in Russian, some are in Arabic, some are in English, some are in beautifully designed. So really, and they were well photographed, so perfect. Mm -hmm. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna display them as if they're in a box, in, in a box with glass on top of them and you look at them, all of them, and you see all the details and you can read all the inscriptions on them. You see something, sometimes a page like this after a page like these is needed. So you put a highlight, you enlarge an image, and you show Nahar Nassar in his full glory as a young man. And the book goes on to show him growing older and older with everything around him. And Nahar for Ayunihim uh, uh, is a chapter about uh, Nahar Nassar in the press. And for this chapter, I took the actual press releases here the actual press releases here on the right uh, bottom. And the title, I took it out and blew it up. So I didn't write the title in typography, but actually used the real, uh, the real visual of the clipping and did the title in. So the, the title here was in this typeface or this calligraphy, this is what I used. So it gave it more uh, authenticity and it gave it more life. That Anyway. I love the, I don't know, I, I love the, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the, the design is not as interesting, but I love doing the book because I felt I was part of the life of Nahar Nassar. By the way, his, his, his son is quite a famous architect also. He's a designer too. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Uh, for the more recent work I would like to talk about, uh, it is Mahmoud Kahil Award. Uh, and this is not part of Muhtaraf. This is a book. These are books. From now on, I'm talking about books and projects that I've worked on independently. Uh, the Mahmoud Kahil Award is an annual Pan Arab juried award scheme in the areas of comics, cartoons, and illustrations. It, this scheme is organized by the Sawaf Comics Initiative at the American University of Beirut. It features the winning artworks uh, in each category. Uh, from Arab comic artists, cartoonists, and illustrators, as well as critical essays relevant to the scene in the region today. I designed this project in collaboration with Khajak Apelian, who Farah told me that, uh, who actually Khajak told me that uh, might be joining you also for a lecture, so you might find some of this work in his lecture too. He's also an instructor uh, and colleague at the graphic design department at AUB. Uh, the book cover is manually silk screened using three colors printed on recycled gray board, like Sabab Akhar. 
hand stitched with an open spine binding. You can see that it's an open spine, doesn't cover it at all. To honor the work and act as a future archive, this book is a future archive of this rich Arab visual heritage. The visual identity of the book relies uniquely on uh, a designed, um, custom designed Arabic hand lettered piece, like what you saw in here. So this is Jaiz al Mahmoud Kahil. This is a custom designed hand lettering. And uh, the, since the, uh, in 2018, the honorary winner of that year was the famous Egyptian artist and designer, uh, Hilmi Tuni. He was honored. Um, the lettering heavily references his work. This is some of design, uh, the uh, Altuni's work, and this is what uh, uh, it inspired. As a designer, I would like to quote Hilmi Altuni here. Um, he said that you have to be yourself, your history, your geography, and your country. And I'll say it in Arabic. عليك أن تكون تاريخك وجغرافيتك ونفسك وإلا الطريق مسدود. هيدا الكلام كتير حلو وكتير عنده معنى مع معي بالأخص مع مع تجربتي بالمحترف وتجربتي مع الخط العربي. في يقول إنه ما عندي علاقة قوية مع اللغة العربية يعني ما بقرأ كتير بالعربي بستصعب بس I appreciate it عندي appreciation كتير للغة وعندي appreciation لأحرفها The book is bilingual I'll go on in Arabic and in English and all the sections had uh, specially designed also lettering the project also included a full-fledged exhibition of the winners of each category at Beit Beirut. Beit Beirut, by the way, is, uh, is a museum that uh, is a place where, where uh, it was heavily bombarded during the war in Beirut. And it was kept somehow as a reminiscent of the war. And during the August 4th explosion, it was blown away again. So oh. it's very funny that it, it, it really suffered a lot because it's it's somehow close to the explosion site. Anyway, so it was there. That was luckily in 2018 uh, with each category with on panels. It was designed, the, the, the whole exhibition was designed on panels as if you are flipping through pages. Um, uh, the, uh, and the lettering uh, mixed with the lettering was a selection of typefaces. Uh, of IBM Plex, also designed by Khajak and Wael. This is another lettering, Rusum Kutub al Atfal. So, somehow, whatever you do in the lettering, you are actually branding the whole exhibition and the book and the whole event. Al Karikatir Siyasi, Al Rusum al Taswiriya al Ta'biriya. So, we did another book, Khajak and I, the 2019 uh, award. And again, signature Arabic lettering. Again, it is very central to the identity of the book and the event. And things like this, you will see Al-Jawaz Al-Fakhriya. Again, it's the same book, but with different lettering and different relationship of lettering to images, the comics. This time, this is how the uh, 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 dividers look. It is bilingual, very hard to deal with because it's all on one page. This year, we had decided to use graphic typeface for the text and graphic Latin. And it became sort of the, uh, the identity for the whole thing for uh, the Sawah Comics Initiative. Graphic is also designed by Khajak and Wael for commercial type. This is the finalist, Hanan Qa'i's page. Now, we, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about books. Maybe I bored you a bit. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, I thought to include uh, some of the other kinds of publications I've been doing uh, most recently. And I'm about to finish. Um, so some of the actually uh, 
community engagement, where you go out of your comfort zone and you do things either for free or because you love doing them. It's not a matter of free or not. It's because you love doing them. So you would like cheerke shumakin al moldua. Jazz or Heber is a jazz and ink poster exhibition. Hajak and I, as I told you, uh, we work a lot, a lot together. We always go to Be Salon Beirut. Salon Beirut is a restaurant, pub, jazz pub somehow, that actually uh, um, uh, gets jazz musicians over every week. And uh, Raya, who is the owner of Salon Beirut, told us, we, I want an idea to design, uh, to, to, to do an exhibition in this place. So we said, yeah, what better than to do jazz posters in Arabic type? So we, we chose, Kazak and I, our favorite jazz compositions and music and songs, and we uh, translated them to Arabic and we called our friends. So we said, uh, Azza, can you do one poster? Choose the song that you want. Kajak, of course, and I were doing it. Naima, can you do one? Lara Kaptan, can you do one? Kareem Farah, Farah Fayyad, David Habshi, Kamil Hawa, Bahi Jaroudi, Wael Murqos, Hussein Nasruddin, Christian Sarkis, Nisreen Sarkis, and Jenna Trabulsi. This was the dream team for us. We, talk, we talked to all of them. They all said gladly they will do it. And we printed 50 posters of each artwork in silk screen. Uh, and the exhibition started on 4-7 yesterday, I was seeing that, and, and on uh, the July uh, the 4th uh, in 2019, and was supposed to go on only for three months or two months, and it's still going on in 2021, because nobody wants to take them out, on, out off their walls. So, um, so I'll take you a bit through them. Uh, oh, I can't remember what this was. Uh, trying to put the blame on me, this one. Awraq al-Kharif, Lara Kaptan, and this is like autumn leaves. What a wonderful world. Summertime and the living is easy. Waqt al-Saif by Naima. Eid Hub Awis, my funny Valentine. Uh, is, is some of my favorite things. We all probably know uh, the song from uh, uh, Julie Andrews' uh, Sound of Music, but it's, it's a jazz, uh, it's also a jazz composition, some of my favorite things. Over the Rainbow, Pili uh, Nahr is uh, Try Me a River. Habibi, Trick Me or Khalini Ibqa Wahid. Leave me alone, something like this. This is beautiful and very funny. Lahadat Masruka, stolen moments, me fair amal. Who cares? This is some of the work. And this was my contribution. Uh, the, the artwork is Kullak fi Kulli, it says. And it's, it's actually a translation of I've got you under my skin. And whatever you translate with I've got you under my skin doesn't work. So the translation was was much more comprehensive. And this is why Kulli embraces Kullak. So I don't know if you can read it, but it's a hidden message there. And uh, it's still going on. So if you ever get to visit Beirut, it's still in Salon Beirut and you get to um, get one of these posters. Design Cross Borders is much more recent in 2020 in the summer. It's a uh, Design Across Borders is a global collaborative design initiative raising funds to send dignity kits to women in the Bekaa Valley camps in Lebanon. So it started in Barcelona and uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a collaboration between designers, women designers around the world. So in its second edition, Across Borders bring together more than 50 renowned designers from 30 different countries at the Disney Hub in Barcelona as part of the uh, Barcelona Design Week, I think. And uh, they put together these um, designers and paired them. And the designers, the two designers, they had to design a poster. And they didn't know each other. So each poster was designed by two creatives from different origins that didn't know each other. And across borders connected them. 
check it out. It's, uh, it's a good source of inspiration for contemporary typography and lettering made by women all around the world. This is the exhibition that happened. The posters are now on sale uh, at acrossborders.es and you can donate directly to the NGO Rescate. It's Rescate who's taking the uh, money and, and uh, giving them to, uh, the, uh, to the Syrian refugees in the camps uh, in Lebanon, in the Bekaa Valley. Uh, that's my poster there. And there were three uh, other, uh, uh, two other, three other Arab women in part of this collaborate, uh, collaboration. There was an exhibition at the Barcelona Design Week that ran till November 29. Arab designers like Nadine Shaheen here on the left, Maha Al from Egypt, and Lara Kaptan from Lebanon uh, were among them. I was paired with Dora Bala, a Hungarian designer. She had already designed Mi Mind, the poster Mi Mind, which meant we all. And uh, we were paired after she had designed this. And we all, uh, I had to do something with them, with that. And what could I do with such a big lettering on the poster? I mean, it's done. Well, how can I add Arabic to this? So basically, I. I did my own lettering and it's designed and it, 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 it's designed to say nahnu wa hum hum wa nahnu nahnu wa hum hum wa nahnu nahnu hum and ma fi shi ismu nahnu wa hum this uh, saying and um, it's uh, there is no us and them we are them we are all the same and the words are inspired from Edward Said's critical discourse on Orientalism, basically, and the dominating concept of the other, or from the West or from the East. So there is no, um, this critical discourse has always been on my mind, and it's a reading text for a lot of students that they should read. There is no us and them. The artwork itself is inspired, is inspired from Al Qandusi's Maghribi script, very organic and free flowing. And this stood. I thought in high contrast with this. So how would we pair them together? I, well, you'll see now. So I, we, we, I thought that I put the text there and I let Mimind go out of it, like a, a, like oh. a building, like a 3D building. So it's all hidden and Anyway, that was my collaboration. You, uh, the design, the, 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 the exhibition is over. And that's it. To end it all, I will end my talk with a lettering I did a few years back. That sums up the design process. Maybe it just reminds me of form follows function, or maybe simply again, head, heart, and hand. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. It was extremely beneficial and I personally enjoy the journey, starting off from the publication design to the competition to the posters. And we can give some space now if people have questions, but I personally will start. Uh, you have a thing with, uh, with the numbering, the page numbering. So when yeah. you're on your books, um, you played around with the page numbering. So one of yeah. them was again on the top part in the middle. And then there was one where you cropped off half of the number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You played around it, keeping it yeah. here. Yeah. And then there's the other one where you kept this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it shows that you're interested in page numbers. I look, you know, you learn some tricks as you grow older. And by doing a lot more than what you saw here, you. I think page numbers are the anchors of a spread. And for me, they catch the eye and anchor it somewhere. They're oh. not that important. They don't play an important part. That's why they are either at the bottom or hidden in the margin. But I feel it brings focus to the page. And I always have that in mind when I'm placing those page numbers. And people treat them in corners and they really under-treated page numbers. And I, I just love uh, to give them much more highlight and let them play a much more important role. Okay. And thank you for that because I never, 
I always think about it, but I never think of talking about it. <laughs> yeah, Nana, it's beautiful how every time you're playing around with it and using it as a part of your design uh, element, yani, an important yeah. design element. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about the challenges as well that you encounter while you're designing something that's a bit formal and when you're designing something where you have like your freedoms, I must say jazz and ink and designing the book of the captain. How you treat each design differently? Well, um, yeah. Uh, after, after years of making this and doing this work, somehow clients come to you knowing what to expect. It was actually when I first started that I had lots of rejections. Okay. And I sort of, when you do all of this work, you sort of test the limits all the time. You test the limits, you test the limits, you get rejections and you sort of go back to what you know can work. Uh, you can get away with some of the things. And uh, with years, you sort of perfect that game. So although Nahar Nassar looks classical, I know what I did in it was a feat for me because I won a lot of, uh, a lot of battles without the client knowing. <laughs> so okay. so I, I know how to uh, mix and match and, and play that game now. But it was very hard for me when I first started because I had so much excitement. I wanted to do great work and very experimental work, big type, small, and I got rejections all the time. No, 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 no. Uh, nobody will read this. Nobody can do that. Um, this is not what's usually done. But you have to get away with it just once. And if, if by chance, you get away with it once or twice and it gets to be successful, then clients after that come to you asking for that. And you build and you build and you start building and taking more risks. But you need that leap of faith from one client to give it to you. And then you sort of start building on it. I hope I answered your question. You, you did, of course you did. I'll leave some space for any of the students uh, or faculty member if you would like to ask. Sure. You can also leave something in the chat box or you can definitely open your mic and go ahead with the question. Uh, hello, let me ask a question about uh, your preferred artwork or typeface. Since you started your journey with typography or with uh, calligraphy, mm -hmm. you uh, went through different types. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes you use solos, sometimes kofi, and Arabic typefaces as uh, as a, as as. Uh, uh, standard typefaces for 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 uh, computer programs which which way you prefer to use to create your own typeface related to the subject or mm -hmm. to use a, a typeface from your own without mm -hmm. without making the subject in focus of your typeface you understand what i mean here it's, I, it's talking I, I, so I think so. Uh, uh, the, uh, when I first started, as I said, uh, that was like um, 30 years ago, no, 25 years ago, I'm not that old. Uh, 25 years ago, the landscape for type design was not there, non-existent. Clear. And I remember that at Muhtaraf, we said, we're going to design our own typefaces and we're going to use them inside Muhtaraf or only Muhtaraf's work. So we're not going to publish them. And we sort of designed a lot. I can show you, I mean, I'm not showing you Mahtaraf's portfolio here, but I mean, uh, so we, we designed a lot. We also designed a lot of custom typefaces uh, for a lot of clients, uh, for newspapers and banks and stuff. Um, and we didn't, because we didn't find typefaces that were visually interesting for us. Ah. The, the, the point is now with the last 10 years maybe, there's a big surge of typefaces and you can find them, you can find a lot. And basically Khajak 
and Wael Murqos and Christian Sarkis and Pascal Zerbi and Nadine Shaheen have designed a lot, uh, along with myself who have designed a lot. They have their own type foundries. I have designed typefaces only for custom clients, basically. So um, um, there is no preferred, if that's part of your question, there okay. is no preferred typeface at all. It depends actually what you're working with and what your instinct tells you to do. The calligraphy, there's calligraphy like we saw in, in Um Kultum, and that is quite classic calligraphy of Nastaliq. And there's lettering, and lettering is bitasarruf. Khat Arabi bitasarruf, metal fikrufan. On your own? Yes. On my own, with, uh, with my own handwriting, with my own interpretation of the letters and the contrast and the way uh, the, the letters move and the, 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 the way the stroke moves. So this is something. Um, this is something very, very uh, uh, art, more artistic, yes. rather than uh, calligraphic. Okay, yes. and uh, this is where I find myself more because this is much freer, and much more interesting to work with. Because I personally cannot add to calligraphers' work. There are calligraphers who are super masters, and I can never master Thuluth or Nasr or. I will never do it and I cannot do it and I will need years and years with a master to do that so uh, it's quite impossible uh, to master so this is what I do and master basically thank you yes thank you uh -huh. it's another question a small one sure. for Muhtarif for Muhtarif. Muhtaraf. Uh, Muhtaraf, Muhtaraf. Uh, yes. uh, if you have, if you have little or some uh, typefaces created by Muhtaraf mm -hmm. to be shown for our students in quarantine, if you have. Um, we can't, uh, it's, they're not published. You said they're that, you said, I know, <laughs> I know <laughs> that, I know, but yeah. uh, it's, 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 it's not to be published. No, I can show yeah. them to you, but I cannot uh, share them, to be honest. They're not out okay. there, okay. but let me tell you something. Uh, at the end of the day, let me show you. I mean, I can show you some of the titles. No, I trust, I trust what you, what you mean here, because I know yeah. for Arabic calligraphy is so hard in current time or, or before to create uh, or modify something to be uh, published before uh, finalizing, I mean, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also, I mean, there are, uh, last week I, I was on a panel uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, type uh, copyright law and copywriting. Mm, great, how much, great, uh, great. How much um, Hello. copying of the typefaces that is happening that is illegal because Typefaces take a lot of time to design. Yeah, I know. They 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 take a lot of our time, and who pays for that if if uh, designers just copy them? Students welcome, fine. But the moment you use them for the something needs to be understood. The moment you use it for a commercial work where the student becomes a designer and gets paid for it for that work, then. The, design, the type designer has to take a part of that work, part of the pay for that work, or else nobody will design typefaces anymore if everybody's copying them. So we give our students a lot of typefaces, but we also give them the, the knowledge that the moment they produce commercially viable work that makes them money, they have to pay for the typefaces. And it is paid as part, not as the designers, but as the clients pay. Their clients have to pay. And this is something that's quite lacking in our culture and in our education for students. We give them a lot of typefaces, but sometimes they use them. They make money out of the project and then nothing comes back to the designer. And then we nag and tell, oh, we don't have enough typefaces. Well, you don't have enough typefaces because it's not commercially not feasible anymore. <laughs> Um, Yara, I had a qu another question. Um, honestly, I have to <laughs> I'll give some time for other people to ask. Um, I wanted to ask you, you said you, you shifted from working in the market to the education because mm -hmm. you saw some misconceptions and some stuff that you wanted to instill in students. 
and as well yeah. into the graphic design industry. Yeah. Can you give yeah. us some examples of these things so our students can get aware of it as well? Sure, let me. I mean, I have to take you to another presentation here. Just a moment. You want to see that? Uh, are you sure? Yes. <laughs> we learned it this right. Okay, I'll take you through that very, very, very quickly because I don't know how much time you we have. So I was talking to you about um, um, bilingual projects, and I didn't really know what to do with them. We had a lot of books that were coming in two languages, and um, I just didn't want to start from the right to left for the Arabic and from left to right for the English and done or to make them separate. So how do we combine and make them marry in one book? And this was some of the research I'm doing. This is some of the research I'm doing now at AUB and it is funded research. And I came out with so many ways. I'm not going to go through it, but I mean, I mean, I'm, the research came out with almost 33 ways you can put Arabic and English together structurally in a book, in a bound book. And we didn't go into the web yet, but this is the physicality of the book since it is bound and its pages cannot move other than left to right, right to left or up and down, that's maximum. Uh, we found uh, 33 ways to do it. So um, this research uses a very scientific method of of a decision tree uh, that makes you sort of get to the point of which structure you get according to the decisions you make. So if you want, let's say, I'll take you through one of them if you're interested, are you? I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so um, basically you get books that are um, bilingual and you get, um, okay, so you say, I want them in both languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want it to open from both sides, okay? So you get, okay, I'll go through this. I'll go through this first. You get the reading direction. You decide you want it to open from right to left or from left to right or from both sides. You decide on script proximity. They're mixed or they're separated. There are many ways to do them mixed, many ways to do them separated. You want to see what is the book action. What is, are you doing to the, re what is the reader doing to the book to read the other language, whichever language they started with? Are they gonna flip it? Are they gonna turn it to read the other language? And the text behavior. The text behavior, is it crossing each other? So the beginning of the Arabic is the end of the English when you read, or are they both going together in parallel? And the second action that the reader goes through is, uh, is rotating the book. These are the parameters of each of these uh, uh, things that you see. And uh, these are the books that you get at the end. So also it studies some of the books that are out there already, like some, this is from Khat Foundation, and it studies how the books open and how, how the reader engages with each language. So uh, basically the uh, final uh, thing is a website um, that will be available for all uh, end of June, 2022 for everybody to use and to yeah. download all of these formats. So you can choose from the parameters on the top here. You want to do mixed, you want to do separate, you want to do an angle, you want to do right to left, left to right and you get all the uh, examples and you get to print them and see them. So. This is, this is what I took from my profession into the, prof into the academic. This is one of the things I took. Thank you for sharing that. I know, I know. Okay, any other questions? Um, maybe I can ask a, a quick question. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank you uh, for this uh, talk. I, I thought it was really, really interesting and, and informative for our students as well as for us, even though my background is in interior design. But one of the things that we always struggle, and my colleagues can uh, uh, agree with me here, uh, of starting any projects with our students. 
-hmm. How do you start with the concept? How do you, uh, and I always tell them, you have to start uh, at, you have to create for yourself a starting point. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, since you have both backgrounds of academia, uh, as well as practicing, maybe you can share with our students just a couple of pointers on, on initiating a concept for a design project. Well, um, always tough to deal with that question. And students uh, always have the idea that uh, is if they look at other people's work, okay, uh, uh, that they're cheating or they're copying. So um, some some of them actually just do it and they don't feel any uh, any uh, regret about it. But some others think that they when they 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 don't know the limit between inspiration and copying. Anyway. To do that, the, we, we, I teach them a design process, and it's, the, uh, it's called the five, w, five uh, W's and one H. The five W's, basically, it starts with who, who are you talking with, and who is the client, who is the brief, what is the brief about, what is the brief about, what, is, uh, what are the deliverables, this is the W, the second W, who and what. Why are you doing it? And in the whys, why, why are you asked to design the design system, signage system for the local transport? Why are you designing a new identity for a restaurant? I mean, how many identities do we still need okay, of restaurants? What makes that restaurant different than the other? And all of these Ws and the whys, actually, I just, I recently learned a technique with why. And this takes a lot of training with the students and we do brainstorming sessions at the beginning. Why on, in five levels? So for example, why are we designing this identity for the restaurant? The answer is because this restaurant uh, needs an identity and it's opening new in the market. And why do we need another rest sushi restaurant? Uh, because this restaurant is uh, getting uh, first grade salmon for Mabarif Shu, for their sashimi. Uh, and why are they getting that first grade salmon? Because everybody else is getting that part of salmon. And somehow, because of the five layers of why, an idea starts forming in their head that what actually makes that restaurant very important. And this is something they should take with them to the profession. Because the moment they take a brief from a client and they, the client says, I want an identity for my restaurant, they say, okay, I'll be back uh, next week with sketches. Well, wait, wait a minute. You have to ask so many questions about why and how and when and what and where it, that restaurant is. This is the five W's. And then oh, sometimes you don't need an identity. Maybe our concept of identity is a logo and a signage and a credit, a business cards and letterheads and all of that are obsolete. Some of the shops and restaurants don't even exist. They exist at kitchens with no sign and they only exist on toters or some app that you, um, that you just um, uh, order from. So you, as, as a designer, you really need to know where, where is this thing that you're doing, this design that you're doing is being seen. Who is your audience actually? So maybe it is seen in an Instagram logo at that small circular size. And that's all you're gonna get out of the restaurant. There is no experience, there is no table, there is no chair for you to sit. The menu is all out there and you're ordering. And this is our new life, for example. So, I mean, then we tell them to analyze all the information they took from the five W's and one H. And the analysis could be on many circles. So you have a literary review. So you're doing, you're reading about the subject. Then you're doing uh, an analysis of what everybody else has done about the subject. So you look into peer designers who've designed similar things. And you look to peer designers who've designed opposite of these things completely. So you might get some sort of 
on the subject and around the subject, and then peer designers. And this is where the inspiration comes. But we always tell them that when you do the, your brief right, the five W's and one H, half of the solution is already in your head. The rest is just research to fill the second half, the next 50%. And you cannot stress it enough because they don't understand it where they're young. Just, I mean, all of you won't understand how much it is important, but you somehow, I don't go step one, check W, this first W. You, you sort of get into it, you know, and you, you do it without realizing what you do. And you actually are doing the five W's and one H. And without them, you always have a surah nasa missing links and you know it in the back of your head that there's something missing in this project that i don't i haven't put my finger on because you haven't asked the right questions thank you for that question actually you know thank you so that it helped so no perfect answer thank you thank you um we still have six minutes so i will use uh, I will take use of the time and ask you one more question. Um, when you showed us in one of your books, of course, one of the most challenges graphic designer have is, as you said, the bilingual language. And then when you saw when you showed us that you did a trilingual with the French language as well, and in that you made a, a cross grid, so text was not even a, like aligned on the same format. How can you maintain readability, although this is happening throughout the whole book? Um, uh, first of all, uh, readability um, is based on several factors. Okay. I mean, one of them is actually the type size, the type color, the mm -hmm. column width, the, uh, the types, uh, type choice, okay? And the type quantity. Okay. So because my text started here, here, and ended here in English, started here and ended here in French, started here and ended here in Arabic. There was no issue of readability here because I wasn't flipping pages and continuing to read from page to page. That would have been harder to achieve actually. Because I knew the text was limited, it actually allowed me to do this. And this is part of how you design these things. You actually look at the amount of text that you have. And the first thing I do, whether it's bilingual or not, I just open an A4, basically, and I do text run in 12 point over 15, let's say. And I give it a medium column width. It doesn't take the whole page. And it runs. And I see, oh, that's coming out to 150 pages. Let's add to those 150 pages, at least 30%, I need to know how much images there are, 30% images, then 30 plus 150, 30% of 150 is, I don't know how much, it's let's say it's 50, we're around 200 pages, plus or minus the introductions and the appendices, that's 210, 220 pages, that's what the book is about. Now, you can say 220 pages is too much, oh, no, 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 we have to go back down on the text side, or we have to make the book bigger. So it's really a balance as you're designing to put limits to yourself in the book. And you say, is it a handheld book? As I said before, is it going to be held in the hand to be read? So it's going to shouldn't be heavy. Yeah. then it shouldn't be all of that. And you, you take into the account these. So the more coffee table book it is, the bigger it is, the more spaces on the right you have to put so that your thumbs don't cover any of the text while you're holding the book. I mean, you're juggling so many parameters in your head as you're designing the format, the size, the type size, everything and all and everything that comes with it. If it's bilingual, it's even like double the trouble. So yeah. here there is no issue of legibility or readability because it's very limited. It seems like it was a success since they worked on a second version as well. Yeah, 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 it was actually. I can, I, yeah, <laughs> time. Okay.
Okay. Um, Yara, we would really like to thank you so much for giving us your time, your tips, for taking us on a tour throughout your portfolio on some of the most important projects you worked in, whether it was book publications, exhibition, poster designs. We truly appreciate that, and I'm sure our students gained a lot of information. Thank, thank you. you. Thank and you, and good luck to the students, especially online. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I would like to tell you, since you were talking, <laughs> since you were talking about copyright, we might have a second lecture in the future about copyright. Yeah. I okay. I think, I think everybody needs to hear the tough news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, we need to work on that. I think we need some awareness that our yeah. students need. Yeah. 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 Copyright. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Farah, and thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ara. Thank you so much for thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.